need him like that, you don't forget him when you come out, do you? I wonder if, if God sometimes is trying to develop a hunger in us and we just won't get the picture. I mean, how many of you lately have asked for the Holy Spirit to just take control of your life? To where it doesn't matter who's around you. Where it doesn't matter if you've got to fall on your face in the middle of the floor, in the middle of your house and pray. Have you gotten to the point where you're willing to take your pride and lay it down for God to do what He wants to do in you? Are you willing to surrender yourself to Him? See, the only way you receive the outpouring of God is if you let God have complete control. It is four minutes to twelve. I don't care. If you have to leave, God bless you. If you have a problem with diabetes, wave at me. I'll send the usher to get you a Coke. But I have a message God wants me to give you today because you need to understand what God desires to do in your life. I'll preach it as fast as I can, but I'm not going to preach it any slower than God wants me to. Any faster than He wants me to. I'm going to be going from the Old Testament all the way through to the New Testament. I'm going to be in seven different books of the Bible today. My wife and I were talking last week about Pentecost Sunday being today. And something began to burn in me. I've got to clarify something before I go any further. Don't be panicked if you don't have any money and you don't pay tithes. Because when God talks about straightening out His house, He always starts from the top down. Which means He's going to start with me. And I've already given Sister Tammy permission. If at any time you want to see my giving, all you got to do is ask her. But I'm the only person in the church that she can do that with. Okay? If you want to know how much I give, go ask her. Last year it was 16.5% of what y'all gave me. Okay? So I learned something a long time ago. If you plant good seed and good ground, you get a good return. I have seen... I'm not rich, but I have watched God move in our lives. I've watched Him work miracles. He just worked one last week when we went to the doctor. Last year, when we went over to Hinesville, to Live Oak, when Dr. Nasir Siddiqui was there and we stayed for three hours, that night we put a $250 offering because the Lord told my wife, whatever you put in the offering will be a tithe of what I give you back. Last week when we went to the doctor, they told us, if you'll go ahead and get the money up front, we will reduce her procedure by $2,500. <laughs> Take 250 and multiply it by 10 and see what you come out with. It's basically like they walked up and handed us $2,500. It works. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 9, you, you ain't going to have time to turn there. Just, I'll give it to you later if you want it. Leviticus 9, verses 22 through 24. Moses is dedicating the original tabernacle, the very first one God told him to build. And here's what happens. It says, Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people. He blessed them. Came down from offering the sin offering, the burnt offering, and peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory, the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people, and fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. And when all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. They shouted and fell on their faces because God had answered with fire. I want to talk to you today about the, the message 
I've got heartburn. I've got heartburn. And I'm going somewhere. You'll understand when I get there. Moses prayed. They dedicate the temple. They offer up praise and worship offerings and peace offerings before God. And the fire of God comes down and falls. And the glory of God appears to them because... They have lined up everything like they are supposed to. They have consecrated everything they are supposed to. They have dedicated everything they're supposed to. They have anointed everything they are supposed to. And when they worship God, God's fire fell on them. Amen. Fell in the temple. They saw the visible manifestation of the fire of God in the temple. That's awesome, dude. I've got news for you folks. That's awesome. The glory of God, the Shekinah, the, the visible glowing glory of God came down and fire came out and consumed the altar, the offering on the altar. Then you go to 1 Kings chapter 18. Elisha is in battle, spiritual battle with the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the groves. 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the groves. He tells the people, today, you need to make up your mind who's going to be God. Elijah says, let the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove get them an altar and a sacrifice and offer it. And I'll do the same. And whichever God answers with fire, let him be God. So all during the day, the prophets of the groves and the prophets of Baal rant and rave and hoot and holler and put on their mess and their show and cut themselves with rocks and knives and, you know, Elijah's over there sitting in the shade taunting them. Well, maybe he's taking a nap or maybe he's busy. Maybe if you holler a little bit louder, you can wake him up and get his attention. And finally, it comes time for the afternoon, the evening sacrifice at 6. Elijah gets up and says, everybody, turn your attention this way. Stop watching the dog and pony show over there and let me show you what happens when you call on the Almighty God. He prepares the altar, sets the bull up there, and gets them to pour 12 jars of water. Fills up the trench he had dug around it. He wanted to make sure they knew what was going on. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 36 through 39, here's what the word says. It came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I'm your servant and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Then... The fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it licked up the water that was in the trench. You want to know how intense the fire of God is? Go and study how hot fire has to get to consume a rock. I don't know what the temperature is where it has to, where it powderizes bone, but it powderized the bones and consumed it, licked up the dust, the dirt up underneath the stones, and sucked up all the water out of the trench. Well, getting rid of the water was easy. 212 degrees, it'll boil and it'll turn to steam and evaporate and be gone. But I got news for you, it has to be intense to eat up rocks. Now, when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. Amen. The Lord, He is God. Amen. You go over to 1 Chronicles chapter 21, verses 22 through 26. David has been undergoing the judgment of God because he sensed to be counted the people. And suddenly the angel of the Lord, he sees the angel of the, the death angel with a sword. 
And he stops, and the, the prophet speaks to him and says, you need to offer sacrifice right now. Right here. And right now, you need to stop everything you're doing, and you need to offer sacrifice. So it says in, verse, in, in 1 Chronicles 21, verses 22 through 26, then David said to Ornan, Grant me the place of this threshing floor, or Ariuna, whichever way is spelled two different ways, that I may build an altar to the Lord. You shall grant it to me at the full price that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. But Ornan said to David, Take it to yourself and let my lord the king do what is good in his eyes. Look, I will give you the oxen for burnt offerings, the threshing implements for wood, and the wheat for the grain offering. I give it all. I'm going I'm, I'm to preach stiff right here in just a second. Then David said to Ornan, No, but I will surely buy it for the full price, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which costs me nothing. There are some of you that are expecting me to pray you out of the hole when you will not go and do what God wants you to do because if I pray you out of the hole, it doesn't cost you anything, but it costs me much. You're trying to have a visitation from God on my prayer life. You're trying to get your answer because of my intercession. And God said, if it don't cost you nothing, you won't appreciate it. You'll never get closer. You'll never grow. You'll never be hungry. You'll always want to give in to you. And you will become a martyr and a victim if something doesn't happen the way you want it to happen. I can preach this way because I've been there and I've been guilty and I've been wrong and I had to repent and get corrected and got beat by God. So it's better for me to preach to you than God beat you. You're welcome. I Thank you. She said, thank you, Pastor. You're welcome. I did, listen, learn. Learn from my mistakes. Learn from, I'm stupid sometimes. Learn from it. If it doesn't cost you anything, you will not appreciate the answer the way you should. You will not give glory to God the way you should when it comes. I felt something in the spirit right then begin to break. My God. Make 14. You are undoing. Manda rosite preponda. But y'all don't just, I'm telling you, I, I feel the anointing of God. Let me tell you something. And David gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold by weight for the place. And David built an altar to the Lord. And he offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. And he, capital he, God, answered him from heaven by fire on the altar. Second Chronicles, chapter 6, verses 41 through chapter 7, verse 3. Solomon has built the brand new temple, the permanent temple. And he is dedicating the new temple. Solomon prays, he says, Now therefore arise, O Lord God, to your resting place, you and the ark of your strength. Let your priest, O Lord God, be clothed with salvation. If you're going to lead, lead well. If you're going to lead, lead right. Let your saints rejoice in goodness. Y'all supposed to be rejoicing. Just so y'all know. Oh Lord God, do not turn away the face of your anointed. Remember the mercies of your servant David. And when Solomon had finished praying... You know that there's a pattern here. You got to pray before God moves. And it's not some of this manby pamby, I need you to meet my need. They're calling on the sovereignty of God. And when you begin to call on the sovereignty of God, you stop thinking about your needs and your stuff and your mess and you get into a place of worship and you change the atmosphere of your heart. You change the atmosphere of your mind. You change the atmosphere of your situation not because God's moved, but because you've moved toward God. Yeah. 
And when Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. Fill the Lord's house. When all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Then you get over to the wondrous book of Matthew, chapter 3 and verse 11. And in Luke 3.16, y'all put this one with John 3.16, okay? Put Luke 3.16 and John 3.16 together. They are linked. John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believed on him should not perish but have everlasting life. Let's throw 17 in there. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. But in Luke 3, 16, John the Baptist answered, saying to everyone, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So when you get over to Acts chapter 1, Acts 1 and 4, being assembled together with them, he commanded them, Jesus, that they not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait, tarry, wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father has put into his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. Now we jump over to Acts chapter 2. They have been there for approximately 50 days. 50 days. They have been there for 50 days. They have been there waiting, 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 yearning, hungry for whatever Jesus promised them. They have no idea what it will be. They do not know what the promise of the Holy Spirit will look like. They don't know what the experience will look like. But when you get to Acts chapter 2, you find out something. These people had studied the Old Testament and they knew that when Moses prayed, God answered with fire. They knew that when Elijah prayed, God answered with fire. And they knew that when David prayed, God answered with fire. And they knew when Solomon prayed, God answered with fire. And so they had been praying, and suddenly there appeared unto them clothing tongues like as of fire. And when they saw the fire, they knew the answer was there. You see, in the Old Testament, it was an outside fire that they looked at. But see, in the New Testament, when Jesus came in, it began to be an internal work. Jesus changed people from the inside out. He said, I do not look on the outside, but I look on the heart of man. I look inside. I'm not looking at how good your clothes are. I'm looking at how clean your heart is. When the disciples were walking on the road to Emmaus, Finally, Jesus revealed to them, and they said, Did our heart not burn within us when he opened up the Scriptures to us? But then Jesus says, I want you to go wait for something that has not been able to be here because I'm still here. It is expedient for you, Jesus said. It is highly important and necessary for me to leave and go back to the Father so that the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, can come to you. How were they going to recognize that the answer that they'd been praying for, the answer to Jesus' prayers, had come? 
God doesn't make it confusing. He doesn't make it hard. He answered the same way he always had. He sent down fire. So when they hear the sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and to fill all the house where they were seeing, there appeared in them cloven tongues like as a fire. And then it didn't sit on the altar. Why does it not sit on the altar? Because when Jesus came, the altar became internal, not external. Somebody needs to help me here. I'm telling you, somebody needs to get this correlation that God put in Scripture. The altar is within you. When you bow and surrender your heart and your life, it doesn't have to be in church. You can do it free falling from a plane knowing you're going to die. It is the place of surrender. In the Old Testament, they had to bring sacrifice to the altar in the temple. But when Jesus died in the temple, the veil was rent in twain. It provided us immediate access to the throne room of grace in the heart man, on the inside. And so when the cloven tongues of fire, when the fire appears to them as an answer to their prayers and the intercessory prayer of Jesus, it doesn't stay external. It falls on the altar. The fire always falls on the altar. The fire always consumes the sacrifice on the altar. And so now since Jesus has come and the altar has been put within us at the moment, the moment where we bow ourselves and yield ourselves, when the fire comes in, the fire sits on them and goes to the altar, to the inner man. And when that fire hits that inward man, and they began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit gave them the utterance. When that fire consumed that yielded heart, and they developed a, an eternal heavenly case of heartburn, When that spiritual heartburn hit them, there was an explosion that came out of them. In the consuming, there was also an empowering. There was a gifting. There was an engrafting of spirit to spirit. God began to speak through them in a heavenly language and in the tongues of men and angels and began to glorify and magnify his own kingdom because the fire had fallen on them. I want to tell somebody in here today, it is time for you to make up your mind that I'm going to pray until the fire falls on my altar. Wow, y'all, that went over really well. I figure somebody will be like, yes, yes, amen, yes, yes. You see... When you go through stuff, how many of you ever gone through stuff? I mean, you may be in stuff. Stuff is rough. You're going through things. You're going through life itself. Just having to deal with life is rough. When you're away from home for the first time. No hair. <laughs> you need Jesus. But there's also... I need something consuming to get a hold of me. I need something to fall on me that when I get into the middle of my next storm or in the middle of the storm I am in now, when it falls on me, there is no doubt in my mind the devil cannot convince me otherwise that God has not stepped in. That God has not stepped into my life. That not God has not stepped into my scene or my situation. I asked God how I was supposed to end this. And you know what God told me? He said, you're not giving an altar call this morning. He said, send the people home and tell them to pray and come back tonight and do what they did in the Old Testament. Tell them to come in and worship me. 
tell them to bring me a sacrifice of themselves. And tell them to cry out unto me until I fall on them. We're going to come back tonight. Some of you may not make it. Some of you won't make it because you just don't want to be here. Some of you want to be here and may have to go home. Let me tell you something. God's looking for somebody that's hungry. Let me run through these situations. The first temple, that the first tabernacle that they had was temporary. They carried it around with them. They wanted God's presence with them. They wanted him to abide with them. So God told them, build me a tabernacle. And he showed up. The second situation, the people are in error. They don't know which way to turn. They need direction from God. Anybody need direction? They pray. God brings down the fire. Everybody's mind is made up immediately. They know what direction to go. The third situation, David has sinned. He's wrong with God. He's wrong with God. And when he is given the opportunity, he wholeheartedly worships and gives his everything. He says, let God's hand be on me and not on anybody else. I'm the one that did it. That is what's called repentance. When you accept responsibility for yourself, that's repentance. And God answers with fire. The fourth situation they are dedicating the stationary, permanent temple, so to speak. And they began to sacrifice. They said they sacrificed so many animals, they couldn't even count some of them. They, 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 it said in one place in, in some of the rabbinical studies that so much blood flowed out of the temple, and they would wash it out a certain way out of the temple, that the Kidron Valley, which was down below, literally turned red because they were giving so much to God. And the fire and the glory of God fell. But then Jesus came. And Jesus shed his blood as our sacrifice. Gave us access to the throne of grace. John said he will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and fire. There will be evidence. Listen, listen God doesn't make mistakes. The reason fire came to them is because John the Baptist said fire was going to show up. There's some of you, I, I can go, some of you do not want me to step out behind this pulpit and start down these aisles. Because you know when I got to you, you'd be, you'd be highly embarrassed, you'd be aggravated, mad, and at the same time convicted to the very core of your heart. God's been trying to move and work on some of your lives, and you are fighting Him tooth and toenail. You're making excuses, you're dragging your feet, you're pushing God back. And everything, and then stuff happens and you use it as a... Let me tell you something. Start tearing down the blocks that you put up as walls and start building you a bridge to where you want to be with God. Amen. The God who answers by fire, let Him be God. He's already answered by fire numerous times. But when is the last time that there was a burning on the inside of your heart to where your spirit man was ignited by the glory and the power of Almighty God to the place where nothing else mattered but Him? That's what God's looking for. But you don't understand the situation. I don't need to understand the situation. I understand my God. Catch on fire. Let God, let, become flammable. Let God catch you on fire. Let something get in you that you neither never had or you lost so many years ago you don't know where it is again. Let God reignite something within you. Let God begin to catch a fire on the altar of your heart and begin to pour forth out of you. This is Pentecost Sunday. This is the day when God answered in the New Testament with fire. This is the celebration. This is not only the celebration, it's not only a remembrance, but it's also an opportunity. My God, somebody help me. An opportunity for you to experience what it's like to catch on fire again. Would you stand?